Es casi una obviedad decir que una vez que la pandemia que estamos viviendo ceda, que se haya encontrado el tratamiento o mejor aún la vacuna para el COVID-19, las consecuencias que tuvo en el plano económico y social continuarán en el corto, mediano e incluso en el largo plazo. Pero hay que advertir también que una de las herencias de la pandemia tendrá que ver con el enorme impulso científico e intelectual que se ha traducido apenas en unos cuantos meses en cientos de estudios científicos y experimentos de laboratorio para la búsqueda de tratamientos y vacunas. Y estos estudios durarán algunos años. Los diagnósticos económicos y sociales, las recomendaciones de política pública tendrán una duración seguramente de mediano plazo. Pero tal vez lo que alcance una existencia más larga y deje una más honda huella sean las reflexiones y debates que sobre el mundo, la vida, el tiempo y los horizontes de futuro están presentes en las ciencias sociales y las humanidades, la filosofía entre ellas. Divya Guibedi, una joven y brillante filósofa india, profesora asociada de filosofía y literatura en el Departamento de Humanidades y Ciencias Sociales del Instituto Indio de Tecnología en Delhi, coautora de Gandhi and Philosophy on Theological Antipolitics, coeditó también Narratology and Ideology, Negotiation Context, Form and Theory in Postcolonial Texts y Public Sphere from Outside the West, entre otros textos. Su trabajo reciente se enfoca en la ontología de la literatura, la formalidad de la ley, la veracidad, lo literario y los racismos postcoloniales. Hoy tenemos el honor de que forme parte de nuestro Festival Alef 2020, dedicado al COVID-19 y las posibilidades de la vida, posibilidades de las cuales ella hablará en clave filosófica, desde una filosofía comprometida ética y políticamente y cuyos alcances intelectuales tienen que ver con las preocupaciones más hondas sobre nuestro futuro, sobre nuestro futuro compartido. Muchas gracias y los dejo con nuestra invitada. The COVID-19 pandemic has occasioned an unprecedented lockdown of the world and through this great isolation we are experiencing a recession in our ability to comprehend a truly worldwide situation of evil. Evil has to do with human actions. It has to do with what should not have happened, what should have been prevented. These modal verbs, should have been, should have not, are models of lost responsibilities. When we look at the world situation, in India, for example, There are several cases where pregnant women and little children who had contracted the COVID virus were turned away from three hospitals before they died on the way. And there are thousands of migrant laborers who are starving or kept in detention centers on two meals a day at best. Many of them have been walking home to their villages hundreds of kilometers away because in the cities where they worked, they have lost their employment, their daily wages and their shelter. Some of them have died of starvation on the highways or were crushed under trucks and cars and even a train. We will never learn their numbers. We should also remember that the majority of the poor in India bear the discriminatory traditional identity of lower caste and they bear all the deprivation that comes with it. In other parts of the world, for instance, a large number of Elderly people have died in care homes in UK and in Italy and elsewhere. And their deaths are due to such willful callousness that we can speak of it in no other way than as a massacre or a genocide. So the devastation of the virus and the lockdown does not distinguish between the first world and the third world, between the global north and the global south, but it does distinguish between the rich and the poor, between the black and the white between the upper castes and the lower castes, and among all them, all of them, uh, women. And this reveals something about the world. Despite all the advances of the 21st century, there is a contrived incapacity in the encounter with this virus. In a way, the mass graves remind us of ancient times when people were visited with plagues, famines and epidemics. 
uh, for instance, the pathos of the plague in the Peloponnesian War that was described by Thucydides. And he wrote of how people had to abandon their traditional funeral customs and they had to adopt the most shameless burial methods as the corpses piled. But compared to those times, our helplessness is different because it is the consequence of our ill preparedness on the one hand and on the other hand, our obdurate tendencies in politics and thought. <clears throat> to say this suggests that if only we did things differently, we could have avoided the dangers of the viral infection and the related problems. These dangers could have been diffused or brought under control. It suggests that the scale and the character of the suffering could have been brought within the scope of human action. Now, out of habit, we do pause with humility before thinking such a thought. But today, we have to have the courage to suffer and investigate this thought in an entirely new way, because it is the thought of responsibility, of human responsibility, political responsibility, and collective responsibility and responsibility in a sense that is much more, but includes guilt and recompense. The previous epidemics in the 21st century, such as Ebola or SARS or MERS, had made entirely predictable a situation like the present one. And yet we have witnessed regionalist responses to something that we knew had the potential to overwhelm the whole world. We are witnessing nation states competing, competing for the humble gowns and masks and test kits and fighting over strong drugs that might not even treat the virus. It's also plainly visible that there is an excruciating wrangle over funds and jurisdictions within federal democracies and also among the members of international unions. The regionalist tendencies have made this lockdown a game of dealing with pitiable lies and deceptions. And these deceptions are not only the ones exchanged between nation states, but also the deceptions that governments have submitted their own people to, the people that they were supposed to represent. In other words, it is the pre-existing tendencies of the world's arrangement that have allowed this viral infection to become a pandemic and that have distributed the suffering through pre-existing channels of inequality and prejudice and deprivation everywhere. And therefore, what distinguishes COVID-19 from the previous epidemics of this century is not its material logic, but rather it's the recognition and the experience of a possibility that is no longer in the realm of an imaginable future. It is right here, right now. How can we witness millions of people in distress and thousands dead and still continue to think that this is something that we could not have or should not have foreseen? It would be like saying that we would rather not do anything about it. And again, this is what happened. But we also know that at least in a tiny number of places, um, things were handled much better than in other parts of the world. This predictability is and should have been the touchstone for thinking and transforming the worldwide arrangement. I would like to stress the philosophical tense should have been. It is a modal verb in past tense and it describes our will and capability in hindsight. Let us call it a model of lost responsibilities or the model of lost possibilities. It is the mode of the recognition of mistakes. It is therefore also the mode of apologies, but apologies that do not merely exchange a gesture for a crime. Architects of genocides and prestigious bystanders of crimes against humanity have often been asked to make such gestures of apologies, but an apology is nothing if it is not followed by the punishment of the crime. And yet the point is something above all of that. It is that this should never be allowed to happen again. The sufferings brought down upon so many in this pandemic are also of that magnitude of a crime against humanity. And the apology we must insist on is the collective resolve that this should never happen again. Therefore, it is the resolve which speaks in the models of lost responsibilities. The should have been opens the fight 
for the ability to create new freedoms. Freedoms from being poor and unequally cared for. Freedom from exploitative labor. Freedom from murderous discriminations at work, in public institutions, at home. And this fight for the democratic availability of the freedom to create new freedoms is politics. As the philosopher Shaj Mohan and I have been trying to understand, politics is the fight for freedom. A powerful poetics of the models of lost responsibilities is the novel The Buddha in the Attic by Julio Tsuka. It uses the first person plural voice, we, to narrate the hardships of the Japanese immigrants, in particular the picture brides who were trafficked to the USA in the early 1900s. Um, their labor was extracted for the benefit of the economy, but towards the end of the Second World War, they began to be seen suspiciously as enemies, and then they were suddenly and secretively interned into camps. Towards the end, the last chapter of the novel gives over the narrative voice to the American neighbors and employers of these Japanese immigrants. They realized that they should have done something about the sudden absence and the likely abuse of their employees and acquaintances who were Japanese. It says, we wonder if it wasn't somehow all our fault. Perhaps we should have petitioned the mayor, the governor, the president himself. Please let them stay. Or simply knocked on their doors and offered to help. If only we say to ourselves, we knew. When we enter the mode of lost responsibilities, we do something more besides examining the past and rehearsing the steps that we could and should have taken. The should have been subsumes the could have been. That is, it acknowledges that there is something we could have done which we did not. This is how we recognize a crime and impute or assume responsibility. Further, the thought of what should have been makes us think about why we did what we did, or in the case of the actions of powers that are bigger than individuals, such as governments, corporations, and global institutions. It makes us think of what it is that prevented us from doing what could have been done, or what we could have done to make them do what should have been done. These recognitions allow us to make a new plan, to prepare a new fight, it is this mode which brings us on the streets to protest and it makes us imagine and propose new freedoms, new institutions, new legislations, new ideas, new solutions, new demands, new collectives. Even further, the should have been subsumes the will have been, which is the future anterior tense. The will have been means for something to be present in our thoughts as a foregone event even before it has happened. This model has two comportments. The first is when the will have been expresses an exasperated knowledge of an unavoidable situation in the future. And the second is the knowledge that the monstrous and entirely unpredictable can always befall us. The first comportment of the future anterior is a sense of futility. The second comportment is a necessary fact. We, of course, cannot think of the world without this possibility that something unthinkable and even impossible can nevertheless come or will come. And yet the future anterior is not the tense that can guide our actions, and therefore it has never been the tense or the time of politics. This is because knowing that certain terrible things are bound to happen is not enough. We are once again driven to build resources against it, to prepare for it. And therefore, the months of February and January, February 2020 are months in which we should have said that the viral epidemic will have come, but its scale, its character and trajectory should have been very different. And we should think of ways to make it happen. It is this model of lost responsibility through which we recognize that the trajectory of the pandemic illness and the confinement have been crimes against humanity. We can also recognize it as a crime 
when governments are striving with such minor contortions and adjustments to go back to the pre-existing arrangements of econo economy and politics, uh, although these are the very errors that have contributed to the present disaster. Models of lost responsibility point to nothing other than politics. Politics is the fight for freedom, and it reminds us of the should that should have been. We should have done more collectively to enable the freedoms of everyone everywhere. Yes, even in times to come, many unfreedoms and crimes will have happened, but at least the paths by which they will become actual will not be the same as the earlier ones that we trod. That is, we can assume the responsibility that the pre-existing arrangement which paved the paths to predictably repeated crimes against humanity should have been changed. The present arrangement is already in a crisis. It should have provided points of departure for new paths to the well-being and freedoms of everyone. Let us hold in view the outlines of these pre-existing paths, which we cannot simply wish away, but which we can strive to change by acting collectively, and that means by collectively imagining the new. We have been unable to cope with this worldwide calamity also because we are immured in certain obdurate tendencies in thought. Many today think that this is the moment of the collapse of that modern world which was in the making since the 15th and the 16th centuries when modernity displaced the old world. There is a growing enchantment with the old world while actively forgetting its own horrors. Underlying these claims is the tendency in thought to posit a destiny for man, whether a destiny of progress or decline. In these visions, the human animal appears alternately as either the all-powerful commander of destiny or the all-doomed. The prophets of destiny have privileged a proper and authentic state of human existence, which they contrast with, on the one hand with confinement, that is excessive governmental control, and on the other hand with overcrowding, migrant masses uprooted from tradition and soil. But what reality could possibly satisfy such criteria? It would only be a village life that would immobilize men and women into strict ceremonial regularities of blood and soil and of the speed of limbs. Such thinking attributes the value of good to something construed as the natural state and speed of things. This is a way of thinking that is hypophysical. According to hypophysics, nature is made by God is good and all deviations from it are evil. In hypophysics, X is good if it is natural. And this is very different from metaphysics, which is about determining everything as some X. We can see that nihilism <coughs> lies within hypophysics. Gandhi's thought was an arch hypophysics that demanded that one should train oneself not to even think or desire or move beyond what nature had intended for us. Such evaluations have made it easier to intensify the hatred of migrants, to ignore the true dimensions of the crisis, and to neglect the demands that this crisis is making on our imagination. The expectation in this hypophysical way of thinking is that the world is a stable matter to which our will can give a form once and for all, make it sustainable and devoid of surprises. This thinking does not even permit us new and surprising desires. But in this vision, the stability of the world's course will be matched by the stability of the imagination of a few people. And this arrangement will then reflect the form of a destiny. Instead, everything reminds us that the world is indestinate. Indestinate does not mean totally unmoldable or something which is wholly free or precarious or unstabilizable in principle. This is another misleading tendency in thinking today, the idea of precarity. To mold implies that the matter of the world itself is free in such a way that it can take on new forms. And these forms can be many heteronormative families, ethnocentrisms, the subjugation of people by people, non-ecological production techniques. But at the same time, it makes the world free to take another mold, perhaps of our revolutions. For instance, the revolutions in love, 
and in our bodies and the development of green energy sources and greener technologies. And beyond that, the world is also free to take a mold that will surprise us, such as viral mutations, asteroids and volcanic ashes. This freedom of the world implies that there is something indestinate about us, the human animal. Indestinate is that which is given to the possibilities of freedom to mold, freedom to unmold and freedom to be surprised. These are the possibilities that are intimated to us by the models of lost responsibilities and by the other models would, could, will. As we witness this present crisis, our situation is something that is described in the last words of the poem Una Vida en el Día by Teddy Lopez Mills. This poem consciously recalls Elizabeth Bishop's poem, A Visit to St. Elizabeth's, but Lopez does not refer to a mental asylum as a special disturbance in the rest of the world. Rather, the poem refers to our whole world itself. Vamos por las piedras rotas, le digo, las laderas de polvo en blanco y negro, con los gomes en el recueto, en la foto del periódico, jugando a que esto es un día, en el barrio el llamado El Paraíso, y no otro día de otro día, que solo termine por terminar. Let's go down to the broken stones, I say, the slopes of dust in black and white, with Mr. and Mrs. Gomez in mind, in a cube that is a house, in the photo in the newspaper. Let us play that this is a day in the neighborhood called paradise and not another day from another day. Let's just end it for the sake of ending. We do not have to accept each day as another day from another day. We can play at making it a different kind of day and we can end it. In the poem, play means pretense, which turns away from a terrible world but it carries a deeper meaning that we can change the character of the day, starting with our imagination. Thinking, imagination are transitive. They produce acts and works, which of course are not fully in our control. We intend, act and create, but the results can be redeployed as components in another action or another's action. In this weave of our reciprocal interrelations, Human bodies and specific institutions meet viruses and create pandemics, which we must fight. Politics is the domain whose time and tense is constituted by the models of lost responsibilities. That is, our sense of the foreseeable and unforeseeable acts and impacts which we initiate and suffer. Agradecemos a Divya Guiberi por su interesante conferencia en la que nos ofreció una magnífica reflexión sobre lo que está aconteciendo en el mundo en varias dimensiones. Debemos reflexionar y acabar de comprender de qué manera la pobreza, la desigualdad, la inequidad de género han sido evidenciados por la pandemia como males estructurales que ya nos acompañaban. Ella nos ha invitado a buscar en nuestro pasado las maneras de evitar lo que está sucediendo, para que no suceda nuevamente. Si la política es la lucha por la libertad, tal y como ella lo señala, debemos construir las respuestas mediante la construcción de alternativas, formas que incluso ya existen en potencia, pero que hemos de ser capaces de identificar y potenciar siempre colectivamente. Debemos ser libres para ser sorprendidos y para hacer del mañana una diferente clase de día, un futuro diferente. Nuevas libertades, derechos y posibilidades están a la vista. Debemos ejercer nuestra autonomía para permitirnos ese asombro que nos conduzca a la libertad, a la responsabilidad compartida y para dignificar así la palabra política y también la acción política.
Thank you.